at Georgia Tech. Um, in just a time, let's just get into her talk. She'll be talking about algorithms, law, and society. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. This is such a fantastic workshop. I'm so delighted to be one of the speakers here. And um, uh, I'm going to be talking about algorithms, law, and society. Um, this is uh, based on joint work with my fantastic collaborators, uh, including my student, Jad Salem, who, uh, who's on the market this year, and Devin uh, Desai, who's a faculty in law and ethics at Scheller, and Vijay uh, uh, Kamle, who's a faculty at UIC uh, Business School. So over the last five years, I've been thinking about, I've been fascinated with algorithmic fairness and ethical questions in different domains. And uh, here's the kind of questions that we've been working on, uh, going from you know, fairness definitions and static and dynamic environments, impact of bias in various applications, how do we even think about OR for policy impact, translating domain constraints so that you have, um, uh, you try to model as much as possible uh, based on discussions with domain experts. And one thing that I want to focus on this talk is the changing legal landscape. So a disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, but I'll try to explain as much as I understand throughout my interactions uh, in this space. So when we think about algorithms, um, this typically, you know, maybe this is one way of thinking about algorithms. You go from data, you have some optimization algorithm, machine learning optimization, whatever, AI, and, and, and some decisions on people are taken. And one key question is what is the effect of these decisions on human well being, right? And we all have, you know, thought about this question and uh, thought about it from different perspectives. And one question that maybe I would like to highlight in this talk is, you know, is this pipeline of data algorithms decisions legal, ethical, fair, equitable, and you can keep adding more uh, adjectives here, uh, transparent, auditable, explainable, yada, yada. And if we modify it, and the next question is maybe uh, uh, more actionable, uh, which is if we modified our pipeline, so that it adheres to laws, notions of ethics, fairness, da da da. Would a pipeline even exist? Like, would we even are we right? Are we going towards an impossibility result here, or, or or do we still have something that's operational? And knowing what's feasible and can uh, what's feasible and not can then help guide policymakers. And so, perhaps our job as mathematicians, statisticians, computer scientists, or uh, researchers is to really help answer this question. So, in this talk, I'm going to talk about two different questions. One that comes from hiring and uh, admissions, and in particular, I'd be thinking about resume screening algorithms. And the second application I'm going to think about is demand learning. So uh, the practice of uh, pricing items as you get more information about the demand that these items face. And with both of these, I try to sort of get to these questions and discuss the tensions between what happens in practice, what's legally feasible, what can we develop algorithms for. All right. So here's the first example. This is hiring in practice. In the summer of 2020, Microsoft uh, settled with the Labor Department for a few million dollars for alleged discrimination on the basis of race uh, from uh, 2015 to 2018. And soon afterwards, there was news that the Labor Department's uh, Office of uh, Federal Compliance uh, Contracts uh, that has placed Microsoft again under scrutiny for um, claims such as these, where they said they would promote more African-American managers to senior uh, management positions. And these claims seemed very race-specific claims. And so they were again put under the scrutiny by the Labor Department. Right. That begs the question, you know, if, if a firm does not potentially look at these what are known as protected attributes of race, uh, age, uh, veteran status, pregnancy status, etc., they could be uh, sued for discrimination because of disparities in the actual outcomes. And if they do uh, mention these attributes, they're again put under scrutiny because of disparate treatment uh, impacts. Right. And um, with this legal backdrop in mind, I mean, one of the questions is how do we operationalize this? But let me talk about the societal aspect of this, right? 
So currently 97% organizations rely on automatic automated screening methods. And uh, this has been studied uh, by many papers in the last few years, for instance, uh, by Manish Raghavan and all and uh, Sanchez Monedero at all. And um, these algorithms are they're sifting through millions of resumes. And so of course they're automated, they're machine learning based, there's some optimization that's happening there, right? There's some NLP that's happening there and so on. But we know that there are a lot of studies that show that evaluation metrics that potentially algorithms can learn from, uh, you know, resume data that we have, maybe the GPAs, maybe the names of candidates and so on, they have their own structural biases of how these this evaluation data is generated. And so what's not to say that these algorithms are already enhancing those biases and uh, uh, you know with the wide adoption of ML. So that's a huge problem. If you're using resume screening methods and 97% companies are using these, this is a huge problem. It's a huge bottleneck in access to jobs. And on top of that, um, just to bring home this message even more, um, currently 50% of the US workforce is skilled through alternate routes. They are what are known as STARS. Uh, that's the term I think was coined by an NGO called Opportunity at Work. And uh, these are qualified workers in the US, but they don't have traditional four-year degrees. You know, maybe they have some diplomas, they have some online degrees, and with the pandemic, a lot of education is already moving online, right? Like people don't want to pay for classes if they're not going to be in person. And so this is going to be an even enhanced uh, problem going forward. So it's a big problem, societally speaking. And so what can we do about it, right? So there have been studies that show, you know, fairness through blindness is not going to work. We need to know what the protected attributes are to ensure that we can correct those trends. But the use of protected attributes also seems to be inviting legal scrutiny. So that's not great. And uh, the key question is how should an organization fix the underrepresentation in their pipeline? Uh, what are maybe legally valid practices? Uh, is there a way to make hiring pipelines fair for stars? So it's not just that I want to look at uh, a company's um, end game. I also want to look at the qualified workforce and make sure that they're treated properly and stars or other groups that are screened out systematically. And how should laws even govern algorithmic screening processes? So the legal landscape, as much as I understand it, based on my interactions over the last few years uh, uh, with uh, people in law, is that most of the laws governed people, and then they started governing organizations. And the laws that govern algorithms are pretty less understood. And so that's where a lot of the development is, right? And so should laws even govern these algorithmic uh, practices of screening res uh, sc screening resumes? Yes, so that. I'm impressed, but it's 97%. I thought there was like more jobs than uh, and job seekers at the moment. It's like, what do you mean by million of CVs? Like that must be huge corporations. Or do you mean that all the corporations in the US, 97% use algorithms? 97% of the organizations in the US use applicant tracking systems. Maybe all of them do not have millions of applicants. More questions? So here's, here's a way to potentially go forward, right? So uh, there's some biases and evaluations data, and one can ask, you know, can we model uh, the biases? So people have tried to have some models, for instance, uh, you know, there were studies as early as uh, 1980s where Claude Steele uh, studied stereotype threats and stereotype biases where he studied. So he was handling admissions at the University of Michigan at the time, and he uh, looked at what is the performance on tests of students if these tests are positioned as testing tests or if these are positioned as fun exercises. And so people in stereotype groups often underperform, under stress, and uh, people who are not in stereotype groups, their performance is basically unaffected, right? And, and so, okay, so there, there are some studies there. In fact, a lot of studies that we see, uh, that we saw in an earlier slide, which talks about this consistent bias based on nationality, gender, and so on, right? And so the idea was that maybe we know whether an evaluation is under or overestimation. And uh, a very nice model by Kleinberg and Raghavan in 2018, they said, you know, Hypothetically, let's say every group has some bias factor. 
So instead of observing the true value, the true uh, score or the true utility of a candidate, you observe a discounted value. So you observe something that's discounted consistently for every member in that group by this factor beta j, and beta j only depends on the group membership. And they had some nice analysis where they showed why Rooney rule might increase utility. And I really like this paper. And this is, uh, this is a model that we also observed for some classification of schools in New York City, where uh, we looked at schools which have um, a low economic mean index and middle schools that have high economic mean index. And we looked at the SAT score distributions. And these distributions were basically shifted by a factor of beta, which was 0.8 or 1.25, if you look at the reciprocal. Right? So we don't see these distributions. And, and this model was really nice in the, in the way of, you know, it's very tractable. You can get some nice algorithmic insights from this model. So it's very nice, but it's a course approximation. Every person in that group is basically given the same bias factor. You know, and how do you define these groups? And uh, you know, should I have intersectional groups? And people have then generalized this to multiplicative models, where they've said based on intersection of every attribute, I'm going to multiply the bias factor and so on. But ultimately, you have a group of people, and you're giving all of them the same treatment. Right? And so, thinking about the law aspect, also, this is basically insulating people from comparison, right? And so, why is that the case? So it, this seems to be insulating individuals from comparison based on their group membership, because we're basically saying that, you know, if somebody is in a particular group and they have some discounting factor beta that we don't know, and there's somebody else in the other group who has some discounting factor that we don't know, we basically cannot compare these two people. And so it's insulating from comparison because now let's say I have a person from left-handers who has a 40% score on their SAT, and a person from right-handers who has a 90% score on their SAT, and we're saying we can't compare these two, right? So it's, it's, it's insulating from comparison from a legal perspective also. And so the question is, can we do something more? And uh, here is what we proposed um, in 2020. The plus is because um, the journals take forever and conferences take uh, uh, whatever. So, so it's... Uh, ongoing um, but we propose that you know let's let's use partially ordered sets to evaluate people and compare them so let's be very transparent about where there is enough uncertainty in the data that i have for a candidate and given that uncertainty if i'm not able to compare two candidates let's just call them incomparable why do we need to have uh, an ordered list of candidates in every algorithm why do i need to have numbers numeric data for different algorithms, why can I not just take ordinal comparisons, right? And so partially ordered sets uh, go back as early as 1948. Uh, uncertainty in optimization has been considered even before optimization in control theory uh, as, as early as 1955, uh, plus uncertainty in parameters. And so this, this idea is, is very natural in hindsight. And so here's, here's what we have. So let's say these, these are two candidates. And they have a slight difference in their GPAs, 3.5 and 3.35, but one of them had a part-time job. Who's to say that this part-time job affected the GPA by 0.15? Who's to say what the ability is? And at this point, maybe we can say, you know, we can't compare these two with certainty. Maybe we can take more interviews. Maybe we can give them a summer internship, maybe something else, but we can't compare these with, uh, with certainty, right? On the other hand, if that guy, uh, this person, we don't know whether this is a male or female or non-binary. So if this person had a work X of two years, maybe that person is more preferred by a company. And so at that point, I can make the comparison with certainty. Okay. Now, let me do this in two dimensions. Of course, on every candidate, we hope to have multidimensional data. Maybe we have 10 dimensions. Maybe we have 100 dimensions. Who knows, right? In two dimensions, I could say, hey, you know, these are my candidates with the nominal data, the numeric data that I see. And I could ask, Maybe these are the two who are topmost in work experience and, and GPA, and these should be selected. But now we have some uncertainty. We don't know whether this candidate was actually, uh, we have an accurate GPA estimate, whether some other dimension is accurately measured or so on, measured or not. And so we have some uncertainty sets where the true data could actually be. We just haven't measured it accurately. 
And using that, if my criteria is that no overlap of regions on any axis, it's only then that I can compare them, then I can start creating these ordinal models. So that's a post set, right? So I can construct this partial order, but I can say, well, if candidates, um, this pink candidate is definitely worse off than these green, and then these two greens cannot be compared because there's an overlap in the GPA. I don't know which one is better. Uh, there's no probabilistic assumption yet, you know, and, and then the, the two blues are definitely better. But now in this model, I can say, hey, you know, I want to select the maximal elements uh, 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 from this comparison. And so now this green candidate also has a chance in the selection, right? And so this was really nice. And I'm, I'm going to talk to you about uh, simulations and some experiments and so on. But to me, this is really getting to the missed opportunities. People who were as qualified, but maybe did not have did not meet that two percent difference in their evaluation because of their training or because of the opportunities or because of the extra job. You know, maybe they are the ones who we can now attract through this just being transparent about the errors. From an optimization perspective, this definitely has connections to robust optimization in the sense that robust optimization is a worst case over uncertainty. It says robust optimization asks no matter what uncertainty is uh, realized, I want my solution to be feasible. I'm asking a different question here. So I'm saying, give people maybe the best possible uncertainty that they could have, best possible data, could we then select them? And I'm not even saying that you make a decision based on this. I'm saying you consider the possibilities based on this. Yes, Hamza? So I guess I'm imagining that like, um... The algorithm provides a ranking, and then there's like a human recruiter that comes and picks people and like observes the behavior. How are you thinking that they're responding to uncertainty? Like maybe you know, like that's saying like no one gets fired for like taking IBM or something. Like people respond well to see that someone has like a lot of upside. That's an excellent question and something I want to touch on towards the end of the talk. Uh, so Hamsa's question is, do people respond well to uncertainty? Do they want to hire a candidate who has so much uncertainty in their evaluation? Or do we want, do organizations want to hire candidates who have very little uncertainty, right? And that's that's a very nice question. In fact, uh, Jack presented this at Privacy Law Scholars Conference, and we had uh, lawyers uh, in the conference, and they had the exact same question. They were like, is, it, is this actually hurting minorities at the end? or is it helping minorities, okay? And so I think uh, it's a question of really translating, what do I mean by uncertainty? It's not that that person is uncertain in their performance, it's that I cannot measure that person's performance accurately. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. Any other questions? Yes, so this is very nice, but uh, I was just wondering if this captures kind of systematic biases, right? This is more about, okay, maybe there is some we have less information or less accurate information. Right. Like, like systematic biases are going to stay, right? And right. This, and so does it, it fix the bias problem? Does it fix all the problems that we have? No, obviously not. Sure. And you also want to be careful that we're not introducing new biases by doing this. Right. Sure. And so I think of this as providing a lever to the policymaker. You know, they can decide of how much um, problemistic uh, way they want to give to a comparison and, and, and then move from that. Great, great. So but my question is that like uh, in terms of like fairness, I'm just wondering how are you going to find fairness based on like if you are going to ignore the whole kind of systematic bias aspect and kind so, of they mask the uh, protective attribute. So one aspect of creating the partial order is to account for the systematic biases in the creation of the partial order. So do that as best as possible and get this partial order validated by a third party if you want, get it validated by the auditor if you want, and then run your algorithms on this. And in fact, even see how uh, decisions change if your uncertainty set changes. And so I, I, I think for me, this just spawns off a lot of interesting questions, which are nice to answer from an optimization perspective, but also nice to answer or make transparent from a policy perspective. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, I, I was wondering, like, how are you planning to randomize over the maximal elements? Because, like, 
you could argue, for example, that, oh, they're all maximal elements. So like, let's uniformize. Or you could say like, oh, the um, blue ones, you know, they had like more comparisons like mm -hmm. leading up to them. So maybe they should be preferred. So that's, that's a great question. How do you plan to maximize over these? I'm going to give you one model to do it. I'm not saying that's the only model. I, I'll talk about that. Yes, I'm coming to the algorithmic aspect of it very soon. More questions? All right. So this, this gets me to the first challenge. I think the, the area of ordinal optimization is underdeveloped. And I think that would be really nice uh, to develop algorithms for this. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, like an algorithm for maximizing spanning trees. Of course, we only care about the order of the elements. So for some problems, it's very natural. But even when you go to matchings, it's not very natural. How do you do an ordinal optimization over those? So I think this um, is my first challenge. And now let me get to uh, an example of how to do this. So how do we construct these post sets? In some sense, I've sort of pushed the problem of bias, systematic bias and fairness to the construction of the post set, right? How do you do that? And can I even justify that the method that I used to do that is legally validatable? Can I, can I stand in a court and justify uh, uh, right, that, that what I've done in my organization is fine? And so they're both open questions, but let me show you one way forward. So here is the data set. Uh, this is Aspiring Minds Employability Outcomes. It's a publicly available data set. It was collected in India. And so you see uh, the college tier is a variable here. I don't know if you can see it on the slide, but college tier one, tier two, uh, terminology in India. Um, so it's a bucket of colleges that are all considered tier one and then there are tier two colleges. And you see there's gender, there is computer science, mechanical engineering, consciousness, agreeableness, extraversion, neuroticism. There's some psychological characteristics. People have taken some tests and they've reported the scores on those. They've reported what their first starting salary was, what their college GPA was, what their computer programming score is and so on, right? And so what we did was we said, hey, you know, let's see, let's act as a resume screening algorithm. Let's try to predict their computer programming score. Maybe assume they're applying for a tech job. In the, in the base data, we had information about male and female uh, candidates for every candidate. There was no binary information, non-binary information. So maybe we also need to expand our data sets. But in the, in the actual data, uh, in the whole data set, there's no skew. The performance of females and males is basically uh, distributed similarly. But when we ran a simple machine learning model, this is just a linear regression, it picked up a slight skew for males. Right. Now, this is a linear regression model. I could look at the coefficients. I could see the gender had minus 16.95 uh, points. And so if everything else was the same and gender was flipped, females would get a minus 16 point score lower than males. Okay. In this case, it was very easy to figure out why the model, where the model had picked up a skew. And so as a first approximation, I could consider the predicted score and I could do a plus minus 16 points into that interval to discount for this fact. But often in practice, we don't even have the machine learning model to play with. Maybe we just have a prediction of how good a candidate is. And so we posited that, okay, you know, maybe we can look at error distributions based on the group membership. Now, I know you're thinking group membership, she's using group membership, is that legal? We'll get to that, right? But let's say I could use the group membership. So then we normalized error distributions based on the training data set. We said, hey, you know, we are going to have, we're going to add some uh, sigma j, which is a standard deviation of the errors that we see on the training set. And that's one way to go from the, the point data to an interval data. For every candidate, you have an interval of where the score could lie. And you don't even need to know the machine learning model for this. And now I have an interval uh, uh, post set. An interval post set is if two intervals overlap, you cannot compare them. If intervals are disjoint, you can compare the two candidates. So that naturally gives us a post set, right? And that gets to the mathematical question now, can we actually design algorithms that can work with such post sets? You know, maybe you get better guarantees or a generic post set. What, are, what about ordinal optimization with that information? Okay, so here's, now we're going more into the math, a, a little bit away from our society and law problem, but we'll come back to that, okay? So the bias secretary problem uh, is, uh, you know, something where we 
basically took this partially ordered model of bias, partially ordered set, model of bias, and we uh, said, we're going to consider a streaming model and see, say resumes are coming in and we're going to do a classical secretary uh, optimization on it. So as resumes come in, as individuals come in, their post-set relations are revealed with the candidates we've seen. And then we want to select, um, we want to make irrevocable select or reject decisions. And a competitive ratio is over any utility that's consistent with the post set. So whatever your post set was, the adversary can assign any numbers that are consistent with the post set comparisons. And I want to be competitive with respect to that. Already this definition has very nice properties. I get to that. And I just want to briefly highlight the, uh, there's been a huge uh, uh, literature on secretary problems, but very few papers that even considered ordinary information. And, and this model is, is new to the best of our knowledge. Okay. So just again, as, as candidates come in, I only see the post-set comparisons of the candidates that have been revealed to me so far. I don't see the entire post-set. And, uh, and then I want to make reject and select decisions. And I want to be competitive with respect to any worst case uh, total uh, uh, worst case utility that is consistent with the process. So this is a very nice theoretical question, right? You don't even need to care about fairness to think about this. And uh, we uh, spend a lot of brain cycles in developing um, algorithms for this. Before I get into that, let me talk about some fairness properties, right? So I mentioned that I also want to be fair towards the people who are being uh, screened. And so some consistency properties that we want are if somebody is ranked higher, then I want a higher probability of selection, not a lower one, at least that much probability of selection. And I should not care about the order of uh, elements. So if elements are, um, if elements look the same to the post set, so these two guys look the same to the post set, they should receive similar treatment. So that's that also has connections to this notion of individual fairness that people have posited, where people who are similar in characteristics should get similar treatment. And so uh, we enforce the same constraint over a post set. People that look similar in the post set must have similar probabilities of selection. Okay. And all we need to do this similarity thing is just make an algorithm that depends on only on the arrival order and the post-set information comparison. And you satisfy that order isomorphism property. And for this one, we basically want a good competitive ratio. Uh, an algorithm that has a good competitive ratio uh, needs to satisfy something like this. Okay. All right. So here's the first hack into getting a nice secretary, uh, bias secretary algorithm uh, uh, for the post set setting. Let's say my post set was just groups. So I had these four groups of people and I wanted to hire five people out of these four groups. So what these secretary algorithms do is that they analyze decisions under partial information. So they don't know what the pool of candidates is going to be. So they sample the first few elements. So let's say, we sample the first few elements uh, from each of these groups, and then we select people from each of the groups. Right? And the one who beats the sample in, in and arrives the first after the sample is selected, if you wanted to select one candidate. Right? And so you can do the same thing, but these are setting quotas for every group, and you know that's not legal in many situations. Right? So we don't want to just slap on a quota and, and call it a fair hiring. But the nice thing about post sets is that, that that group information is no longer relevant for a post set, right? You've made your comparisons. You've probably used the group information. You've made your comparisons. And now you've said that these are the candidates that I can compare, and these are the comparisons I'm going to run with, right? So there's no group information, really. And uh, by design, we don't have quotas but we have something that is known as the width of the post set. So width of the post set is the maximal elements in a post set that are all mutually incomparable, the set of the maximal, the maximum size of uh, elements that is mutually incomparable. And so if your post set looks very thin, it means you have a pretty good sense of comparisons of your candidates. If your post set looks very fat, the width is very high. And that means you basically don't know, like out of these five candidates, you don't know who's better. And so your performance obviously goes down. And so this, the width uh, gives us a lower bound 
on the performance of these algorithms. So there is an omega lower bound. Omega is the width of the first set. That's the lower bound on the competitive ratio that you can achieve for, uh, for the set. And so here's, here's one example uh, of uh, a post set algorithm. And um, what it does is actually, uh, the reason I'm highlighting this algorithm because it does, it uses a technique called labels. So as a candidate comes in, you assign them a fake group, you send them to a fake interview committee, or you assign them a label, you give them a token. And so as they come in, you assign these candidates to these L1 to L4, you want to hire four candidates, you assign them labels. And then within each label, you uh, let them observe the candidates. So that's, that's again, you observe the sample. Now, when you do this for the first few candidates, you get an estimate of the width in high probability of the post set. So we don't even know the width of the post set to begin with. We can get an estimate of the width. So we can estimate the width uh, up to a factor of four with high probability. And so we can decide at this point if we need more samples or if we can work with the samples that we already have. And then every label, so every interview committee, then just selects the best post set, best element they've seen, the maximal element, the first maximal element they see with respect to the sample, right? And, and, and so it's, it's a very natural algorithm. It's not optimal. It's really bad. Uh, it's not optimal. There is a two EQ factor. You can improve it much more. We can improve it in the asymptotic regime when K grows, uh, as at least as uh, uh, log, uh, in, in a particular regime, you'll see it in the next slide. Uh, when K grows fast enough as N, then uh, we can get uh, an order of one, which is, uh, then we can get a tight one. But here we have a factor of four E cubed that comes from the labeling technique. The labeling is not important. You can have an algorithm that potentially does not use labels, but we don't know how to do that. Okay, except in the asymptotic regime. So it's, it's a nice algorithm. There's some uh, takeaways that are nice from a managerial aspect where you can just tell your independent interview committees to select the best candidate that you see within each of these committees based on the comparisons that they can make. And it has nice competitive performance. So here's the other settings that we considered. So we went crazy over what we can do with four sets and what we can do with the group model and what, what if uh, uh, utilities were stochastic, what if uh, arrivals were uh, random or adversarial and whatnot. So these are the competitive ratios that we have. I think the, the, we have an omega lower bound, but the other factors are unnecessary and we don't know how to close that gap. And that's the asymptotic regime where we do get a tight uh, order omega uh, algorithm. All right, a lot of open questions. What if, uh, can you have a privacy sensitive construction of four sets with all of the privacy talks that we've had? Uh, what if N is unknown? Uh, what if uh, a biased Metroid secretary? Uh, so, you know, people, uh, at least I know one person in the crowd who likes uh, Metroids. So, so what happens when you have a biased Metroid secretary problem? The group model is simply a partition Metroid, but maybe you can do more, okay. Good. So, five minutes. Oh no. Okay. So now, <laughs> if if we actually uh, use post sets, then compared to the vanilla algorithm, where we had a huge gap in the selection rates. So these are gaps for males and females. We had a huge gap using just the nominal values when we ran secretary algorithms uh, with the nominal values. When we had quotas, it overcorrected. So the female selection rate went up much more, but with post sets, it basically reflects what the data is. And so it's really nice because it corrects uh, the outcomes of a machine learning model. Okay. Are these methods legally validatable? So yes, uh, we have a lot of uh, connections to anti-discrimination laws. And here are some precedents that are useful. So for instance, the Johnson B. Transportation Agency is a lawsuit uh, where a man sued because a woman was uh, uh, promoted over him for a difference of two points. Um, the Ricci B. Di Stefano is a, fire, uh, is a lawsuit with firefighters suing a company for throwing out a test that did not select enough African-Americans. And um, there are some other 
uh, uh, approaches, other cases where we see the courts allowed banning approaches, which are basically uncertainty over the intervals, which is confidence intervals kind of approaches where they're allowed, like a two point difference should not, does not say that one is more uh, capable than the other. And so they should be treated equally and so on. So we see a lot of connections with anti-discrimination laws, which have been, which has been really nice. And we have a law review paper that's accepted on using uncertainty sets and partial orders for hiring uh, settings. How all of this uh, goes into practice or not, that's, uh, that's a good question. And so here's an experiment I did in a workshop at a law conference. It's a global privacy summit where I gave them uh, raw scores and I gave them uh, these uncertainty sets for every candidate on these dimensions. And they exactly had uh, similar concerns of you know, selecting candidates or not. Um, how all of this applies to college admissions and school admissions is another discussion. And I'm happy to discuss that uh, with you all offline. I'm quickly going to talk about the online learning in five minutes. Okay. So demand learning is basically a very common um, practice. There are courses on that, not to pick on Columbia University, but basically the practice of learning what the demand is for an item and pricing it. And there's been a lot of articles about why shoppers hate price changes. There's management science articles about customers don't like price changes. Nevertheless, Amazon changes prices every 10 minutes uh, a large number of times. And there's been a recent lawsuit where uh, these two uh, people, McQueen and Bellinger, sued Amazon uh, for price gouging during the pandemic. So the governor at California declared emergency and um, Amazon was simply doing their demand learning or uh, profit optimization, right, based on the demand from the people, and, and they increased prices by more than 400%. And so that's what the price gouging laws were uh, violated during an emergency, and this lapped on this lawsuit on Amazon. And so this was interesting, because it got us wondering, like, is it even possible to do um, online learning when I cannot change my decisions arbitrarily? Like, is it even possible to get to the right prices if I cannot have non-monotonic movements? And we looked at uh, uh, these, this is Ban and Kesking doing personalized pricing with linear demand models. And so the prices move all over the place. If you look at UCB, prices move all over the place. If you look at um, Hassan and Levy, then the prices move, they're very non-monotonic in the movements. Maybe they have increased non-monotonicity going forward. And so the question, um, that we are very excited about is, can you do an online learning with optimal bounds, even when your movements are constrained? So think about the online learning iterates over time, and you're constrained on what iterates you can give based on a decision. Can you still have order optimal rates? And uh, without getting into all of this, we basically consider a monotonic uh, constraint for think about demand learning and all of this is generalizable, so come and talk to me after the talk. But in let's say you have students and you have the general population, we want prices for students decrease over time, prices for the general population decreases over time, and students always pay lower than the general population. So we have some cross group constraints and we have uh, iterative constraints over each time. And so that's a lot of constraints to impose on an online learning setup. And um, what I would like to, like in this work, what we show is you can actually get no impact of monotonicity if your revenue functions are very nice, they're smooth and strongly convex. But if that's not the case, then a parallel result by GLE and Ravi in 2021 shows that there's actually a gap if you just have monotonicity. We also consider group constraints and I'm going to skip over all this. So we have movements in a constrained region that's defined by the two customer segments. And we can show how to do that monotonically by decreasing the prices and respecting all the constraints so that you can get an optimal regret bound for two groups and a non-optimal for three groups or more. And that's also something that we are considering. The last point is that 
I don't even know what the future of personalized pricing is with laws like CCPA, which say that firms should not uh, be penalizing customers based on the data that they have. And so I'm going to end here with just that there's a lot of exciting algorithmic questions uh, that are also important to answer from a policy perspective and that are motivated from a legal perspective. Thank you. We have time for one question. Hi, um, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the POSET construction. And if you imagine that like, um, like uh, does it like, what is the connection between the POSET construction and statistical uncertainty? Like, do you imagine that like the size of the, of the POSETs would decrease if we have more data or yeah. is there like some fundamental like, like That's, gap and also thank you for the question like i think uh, yes exactly like i think as as you have more data in a group then your uncertainty should go down and so one way to construct post sets is to say maybe you know the level of uncertainty is one over square root n where n is the number of uh, people who are similar to you in a data set Right. As that similarity increases, your uncertainty in terms of the prediction of the models also goes down. Right. And so having like really quantifying this trade-off of uncertainty with the amount of data that you have, looking into small data set problems. What if you'd used like smote on a small data set? Like how does that change? Like, I think all of these are very good questions and they're all open. Thank you. Hey, let's thank Swati again. So now we have another break. This break will actually be upstairs on the second floor uh, and followed by a poster session also in that same space upstairs on the second floor. So if you are a poster presenter, you can use some of this time to get set up. Hi. Everyone else, please go to the second <laughs> floor and stick around for the posters from four to five. Thank you. I'm not just here today. I'm presenting my